Happy Wednesday, everybody, and some great news today. I hate everybody. <laughs> yep, I woke up, saw some news stories, saw the Roseanne Barr non-scandal trending, which we're going to get into at the top of the show, and I then saw this video of a white guy who was crying after he had to report a black man who made terroristic threats against him because he didn't want to seem racist. And when I got to the end of these news stories, I realized, yeah, no, I think I hate everybody. So today's show, whether you're white, whether you're black, or whether you're Jewish, you will definitely find something within this show that will offend you. So get ready to cancel me. All that and more today coming up on Candace Owens. All right, let's just start at the top. Let's just back this up because Roseanne Barr is on the brink of being canceled again, which I don't think can happen. I think that's like double jeopardy. It doesn't work. But let's back it up to her first cancellation in 2018 because there's something that I really would like to get off of my chest. So back in 2018, uh, Roseanne was canceled by ABC after a tweet in which Roseanne Barr sent out attacking President Barack Obama's advisor, Valerie Jarrett, who she compared to someone that looks like an individual from Planet of the Apes, the movie. And of course, people went insane. They said, oh my God, how can you say that now if we're being honest and genuine, which nobody in state society is. We didn't know that Valerie Jarrett was a percentage black. No, she doesn't look like a black woman per se. People seized on this. Oh my gosh, you can't compare a percentage black person, a small percentage black person to somebody from Planet of the Apes because that's racism. Well, something I got off my chest. Valerie Jarrett does look almost identical to people on Planet of the Apes. I'm going to show you a side-by-side picture. Stop. Look at this photo. It is uncanny. Uncanny. I've never seen a more accurate description of somebody on the left and the right. But because Roseanne Barr said this, and really, you know what they really wanted to cancel her for, it wasn't because of racism. It was because she said something against Barack Obama. Yes, this was the Democratic political machine using racism everywhere that they could to expel anybody who had a thought that might be conservative or might be right-leaning. And so Roseanne Barr was not allowed to have a show, and we all had to pretend like Valerie Jarrett didn't look like a character from Planet of the Apes, but she does. So, like I said, cancel me. I think she looks 100% like a character from Planet of the Apes. I don't know how it works. And does that make me racist towards black people? No, because all black people don't look like that, obviously. The majority of black people don't look exactly like a character from Planet of the Apes. It is a fact that many individuals do actually resemble animals. Does that, does that hurt your feelings? As just one example, the other day, Cardi B and I got into a little back and forth, not an argument by any means. Actually, I was agreeing with her and her stance regarding the stepson of one of the individuals that perished on the submarine. And so I shared a video. Me and Cardi B are agreeing. And in response, she shared a little gif of a camel that was chewing. I laughed at it because it was funny because the camel that was chewing looked like Cardi B chewing gum. And that's probably why she picked it, because she knew it looked like her. It happens. This is normal stuff. When we used to have a sense of humor, when we used to permit people making comparisons, this person looks like a turtle, this person looks like a camel. We all used to just laugh, but now we're in a deadly serious society where everything can be interpreted as racism or, or my favorite thing, anti-Semitism. It's either anti-Semitism or it's racism. And if you're really good at your job, if you're really good at taking somebody out politically, you will be able to say that somebody is both racist and anti-Semitic at the very same time. Which brings me to this next and most special cancellation of Roseanne Barr that we are on the brink of. She appeared on Theo Vaughn's podcast entitled This Past Weekend, and they went into a few minutes of long satire in which she was essentially saying that on YouTube, they control what truth is. They decide what the truth is, and even if it's very clearly not the truth, if you are a YouTube creator, you have to pretend that it is. Yeah, that is honest, obviously. We live that out every single day on this show. Here is what she said in its entirety. Take a listen. There's always been a ceiling on, on speech, hasn't there, in a way? Of course. Nobody wants to hear the real truth. They're horrified. They'd rather go with bullshit. It's easier. And uh, like for the real truth that, you know, and I'm glad that they did set up all these guidelines so that we only are allowed to speak the truth. And the truth is that Biden got 81 million votes by winning 36 counties. 
And that is just incredible. It really, really is. And um, that of these 81 million supporters who gave him more more votes than any president has ever gotten before, he came with a mandate from these 81 million voters. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just glad that they were very careful to make sure that nobody could um, detract from that proven truth. You know what I mean? Like, what do you mean? Like that nobody... That they mandated that that was the truth and that nobody could say, well, what about no? Oh, it was made a mandate. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So the government made it a mandate? Yeah, because, you know, YouTube did and so did uh, all the social... Oh, so you can't speak, you can't even speak on that in those platforms. No, you can't say, you know... That it wasn't. You can't say that, like, you know, the there election was election. Was rigged or, yeah, right. that's all a lie. The election was not rigged. 36 counties can give you 81 million votes. Right. That's a fact. So it wasn't rigged? Of course not. Yeah. 36 counties have 81 <laughs> million people in them. Yeah, 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 yeah. See? That's the truth. And yeah. don't you dare say anything against it or you'll be off YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and all the other ones because we have, you know, there's such a thing as the truth and facts and we have to stick to it. And, um, you know. It's scary. And that is the truth. And nobody died in the Holocaust either. No. That's the truth. Yeah. It should happen. It, Six million Jews should die right now because they cause all the problems in the world, but it never <laughs> happened. But it never happened. Yeah. Mandated. Well, you're, because you're part Jewish, right? Part of your family's Jewish? I'm all Jewish. You're all Jewish. 100%. With, and a lot of Hollywood is Jewish, yeah? It's like, a, it's like a lot of Hollywood is a Jewish business, really. Well, they started Hollywood. Yeah. Right. But so was it weird Just that, like rap. Black people started rap. Yeah. So I wouldn't go over there and try to get in rap and go, all these black people, you know, go on Saturday Night Live like Dave Chappelle. Uh, I'm just saying a lot of black people are in control of rap. Right. Hello. Well, you went there. You yeah. try to get in show business. Of course it's Jewish. But, you know, and people should be glad that it's Jewish, too, because if Jews were not controlling Hollywood, all you'd have was fishing shows. Yeah. So it's very clear when you watch this clip that she's intentionally saying things that she thinks is not true. She's intentionally saying, oh, it's for sure true that 81 million people voted for Joe Biden because she believes, obviously, that it's not true. She's taking a satirical stab. She then follows that up by making it even clearer that her earlier point is not something she believes by saying, and 6 million people, 6 million Jews didn't die in the Holocaust. She's emphasizing that point. Again, she is 100% Jewish. She's comparing these two things and she's putting them next to each other because she's saying how ridiculous it is that any person would believe this. It's obviously satire. People saw this clip and decided it doesn't even matter if it's satire. It doesn't even matter if she's telling a joke. She's not even allowed to say that. And they rushed to say that Roseanne Barr should in fact be canceled. So first and foremost, kudos to Theo Vaughn, who instantly came out and defended her on this podcast. He tweeted this. This Roseanne Barr clip was sarcasm, folks, a clip taken out of a long, sarcastic rant she had during our chat. Can we not recognize sarcasm anymore? I can recognize it, Theo Vaughn, because I'm a sincere person, but the entire world just waits on the brink to cancel people, and they don't want sarcasm. What they want is the ability to watch somebody fall, and in this case, they want somebody to fall twice. This really should contextualize for you how insincere this cancellation is. You have Jonathan Greenblatt from the Anti-Defamation League. They are actually, in my opinion, the purveyors of racism and anti-Semitism. John Jonathan Greenblatt writes, sarcasm or not, Roseanne Barr's comments about Jews in the Holocaust are reprehensible and irresponsible. This isn't funny. So basically what he's saying is it doesn't matter whether or not it's sarcasm. No, Jonathan Greenblatt, it does matter whether or not it's sarcasm. It does matter whether or not she meant these things to be true or if she was being tongue in cheek. Because what you are suggesting, Jonathan Greenblatt, is that we need to start eating the people that are comedians in our society. And once you start going after the people that are supposed to make you laugh, you are no longer allowed to say anything. It is why I am a staunch defender of comedians, even the ones who insult me. Let us not forget, Dave Chappelle notoriously went on stage and said some really disgusting things about me because he didn't like my video about George Floyd. And do you want to know what I did when the entire world was coming at me waiting for me to comment and say something about him? I defended him. 
I said comedians must remain a protected space. We do not kill the jokers in a society. When you kill the jokers in a society, what you have is a society where that is being run by an authoritarian. And that's exactly what the left wants. They want to be able to control speech so much that comedians cannot even make tongue-in-cheek jokes. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, I didn't think that what she said landed, fine. Say that. You're allowed to say that. You're allowed to say that I don't think the joke is funny. When it came to Dave Chappelle, I didn't think anything that he actually said about me was objectively funny. But do not pretend that you think that she was being sincere. I'm sick of it. Everybody's a crybaby. Everybody wants to be a special victim class. And the truth is, none of you are. Grow up. American society has become such a joke. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Faith is an essential part of my life. My family is always looking for ways to deepen our faith and grow closer to God. And that usually begins with prayer. But it can be hard to stick to a meaningful prayer routine, which is why we love Hallow. Hallow offers a wide range of guided meditations, thoughtful prayer sessions, and daily reflections that are designed to help you connect with God on a deeper level. With Hallow, you can customize your prayer experience by setting reminders, choosing a prayer theme, and even specifying the length of your prayer session. Hallow is helping me and thousands of others maintain a daily prayer routine, and it can help you too. Just download the app for free at hallow.com slash Candice. Not sure where to start? Check out Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year, available on the Hallow app for brief daily readings and reflections. Or you can pray alongside Mark Wahlberg or Jonathan Rumi, who portrays Jesus in the popular series, The Chosen. Get an exclusive three-month free trial at hallow.com slash Candice. That's hallow.com slash Candice. Hallow, the number one Christian prayer app in the United States. Okay, now it's time for some topics du jour. All right, white America, you're up. I've got questions for you today. I don't know what I just watched, and I just have, like I said, questions, and I'm going to need some answers regarding how far we're really going to take this white guilt thing. So what I'm about to show you is a white gentleman down in Georgia who called 911 because him and somebody else were walking through the park. They came across a black man who was making threats against them while brandishing a weapon, while carrying a knife. So you would think that, goodness, finally the police officers arrive and they're relieved. But no, they're not relieved because they don't want to, the black guy to get in trouble because they don't want to be racist. If you think I'm making this up, I guess, guys, just take a listen. He was arrested and charged with simple assault and terroristic threats. Following his arrest, he was transported to the DeKalb County Jail. Let's go to the squad car, please. Why? Why is it happening? I'm being arrested? Yes. yes. For what? For what? Just one second. Are you, are you mm-hmm. I, I just want to speak But still, he, um, I will need for you to fill out a statement for him. I don't want him arrested. I just want to leave him alone. I know, but he had a weapon on him and it was terrorist threats. Brandishing is not a crime with a knife. Brandishing is only a crime for a gun. Terroristic threats, though, sorry. Because he said die to me <laughs> and had his knife out? What, all that was done. The threats, everything. Okay. If I I'll thought, get, let me get if a I statement. I thought you were going to arrest him, I wouldn't call. I just wanted to leave us alone. I understand, but we still have a job to do. Now he's going to say, he's going to think I'm doing this because I'm white and he's black. Or he's homeless and I'm not. I don't want but did that. He, but did he do what he did? <laughs> yeah, but I don't want him thinking I did it because he's in whatever situation he's in. I just want him to leave us alone. I doubt that. If you are a white person in America, I want you to head to hang your head in shame right now. I want you to hang your head in shame right now because what did I just watch? I can tell the officer is a black woman and I know she's thinking like, she's just like, what's happening here? Uh, you called us because he was brandishing a weapon. He's like, what did he do? Well, yeah, he's brandishing a weapon, but it's a knife. It's only a problem if it's a gun. What did, what did he do? Yeah, because he said die. She's probably thinking, yeah, no, exactly because he said that he wanted you to die. He was brandishing a knife. Sir, you're basically lucky to be alive, and you're now pleading with me not to arrest him. And then it's just the way he cries like such a little bitch. His voice goes all high. I don't want him to think I'm racist. I don't want him to think I'm a bad, bad white man. I'm a nice white man. Like, what did I just watch? What happened? 
okay, BLM rotted this guy's brain. It rotted his brain. He is like, he would rather die. Literally, he would rather die than have a black man arrested for trying to kill him. And I don't, I don't even know how that officer stayed calm because I would have burst out laughing. There's just no way I would be like, ma'am, sir, sir, ma'am, maybe is perhaps more correct. (laughs) Ma'am, really this tail in between the legs lifestyle has got to end. White guilt has got to stop, guys. BLM was a scam. Okay, you guys got defrauded. It's time to come back out, put a little hair on your chest and realize that when somebody tries to kill you, you are in the right to call the cops, whether or not that person is black, white or Hispanic, guys, or any other race, because that's the right thing to do. Please preserve yourself. So the survival instinct has just been crushed by BLM, and it's really embarrassing to see. So as I said, hang your heads in shame. Repent. Speaking of repent, guys, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe it because I couldn't believe it. And I, I'm really upset that my husband sent this to me this morning. There was a Lutheran church that is reciting the Sparkle Creed and describing the non-binary God and Jesus's two dads. I feel like I am blaspheming. Take a listen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and let us confess our faith today in the words of the Sparkle Creed. I believe in the non-binary God, whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads, and saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit, who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints, as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the ace quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud, and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the calling to each of us that love is love is love, so beloved, let us love. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief, Amen. I believe that some people do genuinely want to go to hell. I think that is what I would say about that clip. And I have been pretty honest with you guys about my spiritual journey and why I feel that I am in this space, ambiguous space, uh, that the Protestant faith to me is, I just have a lot of questions about it because you see these extensions, you know, you have people that are like, oh, out in California, there's that pastor who's now permitting there to be female priests. And he's like, no, I've now studied the Bible and I can read it and understand that actually there's supposed to be female uh, female pastors, pardon, and I fully and adamantly disagree with that. And the fact that there are so many Protestant faiths and each one of them interprets the Bible in their own way Yeah, it does feel a little bit to me like Americana, like Americanism. You can take something, you read it, you have your own interpretation, you say, well, this is my truth. And that was, that's something that I have been exploring. And this is something that I would say would not happen within the Catholic faith. I don't believe that um, they have these sorts of severe disagreements that now you're seeing a Lutheran church. um, And when you go out and you see these Methodist and Lutheran churches, they're or LGBTQ flags on them. And they say, well, we're a Protestant faith and we interpret the Bible in our own way. Again, for me, it's just leading to a lot of spiritual questions, but that clip is like, wow, that has gone very, very far. All right, guys, let's move on because my dad sent me a text a couple of nights ago and he said that I was in a Gabrielle Union movie and I said, what are you talking about? And I guess it's on Netflix right now and it's called The Perfect Find and they're making fun of me. They're kind of ribbing me as an individual. Let's take a listen to what Gabrielle Union has to say in this clip. And rolling. Hi, I'm Jenna Jones, the new creative director for Darcy. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Cut, cut. Whose voice is that? Mine. You sound like Candace Owens. I don't sound like Candace Owens. Oh, (laughs) what is the implication there? That if you speak proper English, you sound like Candace Owens. Now, I'm just to be clear, I'm not offended by that at all. But I do want to say that it does point to this repeat bigotry of low expectations that you see in black America, that unless you make blackify your voice or if you speak with colloquialisms, then you're somehow not black. And that's what they're doing. They're basically saying that she sounds like a reporter. She sounds proper. 
and therefore she sounds like Candace Owens and this kind of recurring joke that Candace Owens is somehow not black because she doesn't identify with the black culture, which I don't. I like speaking proper English. I think it's uh, really fun. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right, guys, we have to get to this. It's very frustrating for me. And I know people are going to be upset with me because they're going to say, oh, my God, why are you covering Kim Kardashian? Because she's culturally relevant. And I, when I saw this trending, I was just angry for the bride. I get that this is one of her friends. Well, one of her friends, Stephanie Shepard, formerly her assistant, got married the other weekend in Beverly Hills. And I want to show you what people wore to this wedding before I show you what Kim Kardashian chose to wear to this wedding. So here's a photo of Alicia Keys attending Stephanie Shepard's wedding. She looks lovely. In case you don't know anything about Alicia Keys, she's very anti-makeup. She's absolutely has beautiful skin and she's glowing. And she is there with her husband. Looks appropriate. Looks like she's at a wedding reception. Now let's cut to Hailey Bieber. This is Justin Bieber's wife. She's also a model. She looks spelt. She looks sexy, but I would say appropriate for an evening wedding. Definitely like the way her hair looks. Now let's cut to Khloe Kardashian who is Kim Kardashian's sister. Actually, this is a great shot because then we can get a general mood of how everybody was dressed. You have Khloe Kardashian. Again, she looks like she's in evening black tie attire. She's wearing pearls. Lala is to her right. She's another entertainer. She seems to be wearing a black dress. You see people in the back, they seem to be wearing what I would say is normal wedding attire. Now, what do you think Kim Kardashian, before I even say, what do you think Kim Kardashian wore to the wedding? If you're listening to this, you're going, what would Kim Kardashian wear to a wedding? Your first answer should always be nothing because Kim Kardashian must always have the attention on her even when it's at somebody else's wedding. She needs everyone to look at her and go, oh my God, what is she wearing? Because there's no way that every single guest would not immediately look at someone who turns up naked to a wedding. Here's what she decided to wear. This makes me so angry because there is just no reason to aspire to this level of being a hoe. There's just no reason. And that's, that's the only way to say it. Frankly, everything about her career from orchestrating her own sex tape with her ex-boyfriend, Ray J, to selling her own sex tape and pretending that she was a victim of it, to now wearing this to a wedding just shows you that she actually, far from being secure, is the most insecure woman in America. Have some respect for your former assistant. Have some respect for a person when you attend their wedding. Do not show up looking like Ursula has eaten the Little Mermaid, okay? This wouldn't even be appropriate to me if she was at a beach, but the fact that she's at a wedding wearing this, I'm just disgusted. And don't tell me it's not relevant. Look at her next to her friend. Don't tell me it's not relevant that she's literally half naked at the wedding. She must have attention always on her body. And again, it reads to me like a massive insecurity. It is so upsetting to me that there are so many young women that follow her, that find this to be aspirational, that think that sex sells. Look at her life, okay? There is, yes, a ton of money, a ton of cash. She can fly wherever she wants in the world at the drop of a hat. But is that really happiness, right? That she feels so insecure that she has to remove attention away from the bride and have it looking at her, looking at her because she just needs people to realize, I'm naked and I'm actually just really confident, which is why I'm wearing this. Um, Stephanie actually said it was okay for me to wear this. She approved this and it's totally fine. It's not totally fine. This isn't even a question to ask a bride if you should wear this. It is a flagrant no. If a bride personally asked me to wear this to their wedding, I wouldn't wear it because it's so disrespectful. But she has no concept of disrespect in her head. This is a family that is engaged in pornography that has brought in softcore porn to Instagram to an entire generation of people who think that this stuff is normal and it's not. So I just wanted to gently touch upon that. If that was gentle, I did my best because I am just so routinely sickened by everything that Kim Kardashian represents in our society. Wear some effing clothes for once in your life. I've been so encouraged by the effect conservatives have had on culture recently with our boycotts of Bud Light and Target. When these companies stood in direct opposition to our values and quite literally came for our children, we said no more. And as a result, these companies have lost a combined $28 billion. That is a major win. As we continue to stand strong against these woke corporations, I'm always looking for alternatives so that we can support those that align with our values. One company that I'm proud to stand behind and is proud to stand behind us is Pure Talk. Pure Talk is veteran owned and has a 100% American workforce. They share our values, which is why Pure Talk is the official cell phone wireless partner of The Daily Wire. But that's not the only reason. We've checked the coverage and it's the most dependable 5G network in the United States. They're top tier, but at a fraction of the cost. Mix and match your plans to fit every person in your family. You can choose from talk, text, and 5G data for just $20 a month, all the way up to unlimited data with a mobile hotspot for $55 a month. 
You vote how you spend your money. So go to puretalk.com slash Owens. You'll get great coverage and you'll save while you're doing it. When you go to puretalk.com slash Owens, you'll save an additional 50% off your first month because they actually value you. That's puretalk.com slash Owens. Pure Talk, wireless for Americans, by Americans. All right, guys, we have a little bit of extra time, so let's jump into your comments from episodes past. The first set of comments are regarding Gabrielle Union and Dwayne Wade. We talked about their in their 50-50 split in their relationship, that they're even splitting children expenses uh, 50-50. They're one child that they share, and I find that to be very bizarre. And I asked the question, what is the point of being in a marriage if you don't want to blend your names, you don't want to blend your finances? Aren't you guys just glorified roommates? Well, Akila Brooklyn writes, the minute he told her this was my house, the rules changed. Their relationship and monetary dynamic went from 100-100 to 50-50. When a marriage is built on a faulty, distrustful premise, expect financial negotiations to be met in the same manner. The irony, most married couples who are from the lower to middle income class bracket tend to see their marriage as 100-100. When God is not in the center of your marriage, there will be no amount of money that will compensate for his absence. God is needed in every marriage, not million dollar weddings for already distrusting couples. Marriages are sacred unions. We need to feel safe in these unions. Yeah, I like that you use the word safe, like feeling safe in the union, because there's something about that, that you can hear her when she describes how she feels like she has this monkey on her back, that she doesn't feel safe in that union, which is which is really interesting, right? She's got a husband worth $175 million. She's worth quite a bit of money herself, but she feels like she has to keep working because she doesn't feel like her husband necessarily has her financial back. And that's why I was commenting on it. It's actually quite sad. Omaha Tony writes, my marriage is very old school. I work. My wife is a stay-at-home mom. My wife took my last name. We combined all of our finances from bank accounts to retirement. We file taxes jointly. We are each other's beneficiaries on everything. All of our real estate is owned jointly. We don't have a prenup. I've had other guys tell me I'm not smart for doing things this way, but I just don't care about their opinions. I have full trust in my wife, and she fully trusts me. And that is the only way to go into America, uh, go into any marriage, is to fully let go. I had some people that were asking questions. What do you and your husband do? It's exactly that. I took his last name. We combined all of our finances, our bank accounts. I do have one account that's all my own, just because I would like to be able to buy him presents without him being able to see exactly what I'm getting him for Christmas. I keep a small amount of money in it, and I've had that account since I was literally in high school. Um, so there was no reason for me to shut it down. But the idea that something is just mine or just his would make me feel really uncomfortable. It would make me feel like I was dating again, really. And that's why I go back to that um, roommate analogy. Rosalie, Ro- Rosella, pardon, Deha writes, I disagree with the whole last name thing. In my country, it's completely bizarre and foreign to take a man's last name. And I couldn't imagine changing my last name to my husband's. I respect a woman's choice to do so, but I completely understand why some, like myself, wouldn't feel comfortable doing so. Yeah, I saw a few of these comments saying that uh, depending on what country you live in, it's actually not traditional. I guess I was commenting more on where it is traditional to take your husband's last name because I was trying to show people to really illustrate how progressive Americans have become. They're not doing it because this is the way it's always been. They're they're going backwards and saying, I want to keep my last name because for them, it's something that's new and progressive. And so that's the reason that women do it. By the way, a ton of people ask Candace, you kept your last name. Uh, your show is called Candace Owens. Yeah, my show is called Candace Owens, but that's not my name anymore. I got married in the middle of my career. So it would have been weird as we were, me and my husband met when my book was coming out and everything said Candace Owens to suddenly flip all of that and change it. I also had established LLCs with my last name. So, but my, my last name is my husband's last name. So a show can have a title. It can be called Oprah, I suppose, but her last name is Winfrey. Her name is Oprah Winfrey. So I don't, I didn't really understand how people were commenting, why is this show called? Because I've, I've had this show contract since marriage. So, All right, getting into another topic. A lot of you guys had things to say about the Brian Koberger case, which I am finding fascinating. Actually, I think yesterday I learned that the judge is now gagging investigators on the case. So nobody is allowed to talk about this. Some people were saying to me, well, it's because they don't want them to mess up the case. How could you mess up a case? If you stabbed four people in a span of 15 minutes and you have DNA evidence, if I, we talk about it every day on the show, the case is not going to be ruined. They're not going to be like, oh, well, because Candace Owens spoke about it on her show, we can't use this DNA evidence. I just think that that's so ridiculous. Anyways, let's get to your guys' thoughts, not mine. I already gave you mine. EMC8271 writes, wait, Candace. What about the DNA on the handle of the knife? I don't know about you, but to me, I wouldn't need any more evidence after hearing his car and phone placed him at the scene on the night of the murders. 
and his DNA was on the handle of the knife, that would be enough to convict him in my eyes. To be clear, they never found the knife, okay? You're talking about the sheath, which the knife went inside of, and they used, as I said, 23andMe, the FBI used 23andMe data analysis to link him to that sheath, and the FBI is not saying how, what their methods were, which I find to be very bizarre. Like, you have to obviously say your methods so that they can build up a defense. And why it's weird to me is that this is all hinging on this sheath when, in fact, obviously, four people, unfortunately, lost their lives that night in a vicious slaughter that allegedly took 15 minutes. There should be more than just a sheath to rely on, I think, is what the obvious point is here. And so I was just really struck by the fact that they're saying that there's no other DNA evidence. And I do think that the public has a right to hear more. More And, and regarding the, uh, the, the phone placement, this, they were talking about cell phone pings. Now, I am not too educated on that, but my understanding is that cell phone pings can happen within a range of 15 to 20 miles. And in this particular town, he lived there. So he lived within that range. But again, I can't tell you that for sure because we haven't been able to see any of the evidence. Morticia 1313 writes, as far as Brian Koberger goes, is it possible we are just not aware of all of the evidence that the prosecution has? Yes, that's very possible. I also believe he could have prepared his car in advance, maybe covering it with plastic. Then he had the two hours that his phone was off to dispose of any evidence, including all of his clothes, and an additional six weeks it took to arrest him. Maybe the gloves he was wearing prevented him from getting cuts. Also, the text messages to one or two of the victims seems very coincidental. Do they have a strong enough case? I don't know, but I also thought OJ and Casey Anthony were open and shut cases. Yeah, that's what we're getting at. We've never have alleged here that he is innocent. Um, rather, that it doesn't seem that the prosecution has a very strong case and that they're being weird about not allowing any person to talk about it. So it's more of a commentary on whether or not they're going to be able to prove that he is guilty, not to allege that he isn't guilty. I, I don't know is the whole point. I'm just very fascinated by this case. And Matt writes, what I find the weirdest thing in the Koberger case is the girl witnessing the murders and then going back to bed and then chilling in her flat until noon with the dead bodies before calling the cops. Like, oh, I'm so shaken. I'm just going to chill next to the corpses until I feel better. I can call the cops. Yeah, we don't even know much about that. And, you know, I don't want to castigate her in any way. Obviously, she has suffered a tremendous tragedy. These are all of these open-ended questions. And I just can't accept that knowing the answer to any of this would somehow disrupt this case. It doesn't make sense to me. And obviously, you guys know that we personally have been working on our own documentary covering the Stephen Avery case and learning how quickly they came out. They told the details of how Teresa Hallback was murdered in that case, in case you guys haven't seen Making a Murderer on uh, Netflix, we are doing a follow-up to that called Convicting a Murderer. And as we're going through this, every piece of information was given to the public. Uh, the trial was publicized. So this doesn't seem to me to be real reasons to lock everything down as somebody who is now getting very into true crime stories. All right, guys, that is all the time that we have for today. As a reminder, A Shot in the Dark is available now on Daily Wire Plus, so be sure to click the link in the description and subscribe right now. And be sure to come back tomorrow because there will be a brand new episode.